Hi, this is Clifford Carnicum from the Carnicum Institute, and this is the second in a tutorial series to in introduce uh, folks to the geoengineering and climate uh, change model. Uh, this tutorial will be very brief, as is the first tutorial, and is intended simply to demonstrate the mechanics of getting access to features on the program and it has nothing to do with interpretation of uh, events or analysis at a more sophisticated level. The first video has been completed on the tutorial side which introduces the greenhouse gas uh, component of this model which is on the left side, upper left side, upper left corner and it also introduced uh, the uh, aerosols into the model which is on the right side. In addition to that, the output uh, from both of these inputs was also discussed. There are two additional videos available at this time that go into greater depth on analysis and interpretation of various scenarios using the model. I plan to make uh, another video of that nature that ties in all of the features that are now available in the model together. The purpose of this video is to introduce um, three other um, uh, developments that have been incorporated into this model, again from purely a mechanical point of view. Previously, the model only um, worked with immediate or what I'd call short-term effects. Uh, let's start uh, using this a little bit so we can see. Let's say we bring up the model and we basically uh, don't know what to do. We don't do, any, do anything except just hit the submit button right here. And if you hit that, basically you'll have no response because you haven't made any changes. And that will be demonstrated up above. And you have a chance to uh, go back uh, with this uh, button here. And this time let's make a little bit of a change to the model. So we're increasing the carbon dioxide percent. This is an annual change in percent. Each year it would change by uh, that much uh, allows for the model allows for both increase increases and decreases in all the variables um, that are occurring here. So let's say we introduce a little higher level of CO2 into the into the atmosphere, then we will start to see some kind of effect, and we have discussed this prior. Um, uh, and um, you get the you basically get three things: you get the the direction of the change being either heating or cooling effect. You get the magnitude of the change uh, by the height of the bar here and then you get a time factor associated uh, with that change and that time factor is described down here below. Uh, in this case as a doubling, a doubling of the heating rate. Now what I'd like to introduce to you is another portion that has now been included in this model. And this is to take that information and to extend it uh, forward in time and pr project it according to some kind of reference uh, value so we can get some kind of sense of what that impact would be over the future. And the reference points, the reference points that have been chosen are a change of one degree of temperature, this is all in centigrade, one degree of temperature change and five degrees change and this graphic here is going to show us that and what we're really looking for in the model is a solution to the amount of time that would be required for that change to be affected and this graph will give that uh, information uh, again it's a model everything is an estimate but uh, the, the one of the values is we can certainly understand relative changes um, fairly easily by, by experimenting with the model and we're seeing that uh, you can see that it's a nonlinear relationship that has been um, set up here. But these two values here in years, in this case roughly 700, and in this case roughly 1500 years, uh, are involved between the one degree change with this uh, red bar here and the five degree uh, change at the top. Now, uh, recall that the one degree and five degree changes uh, are significant, highly significant, from a global standpoint of impact and I have given uh, some indication of the significance of that uh, relating that to anticipated or likely effects on the ability to produce food um, in the world based upon those changes. A, a, an estimate 
uh, is that uh, one degree would result in about 15% uh, decrease in the ability to produce food. And the five degree, th this, at this case, it's a linear relationship. Actually, it could be worse, but a 75% um, effect on crop. Again, these are estimates. So um, let's work this, and we can hit this back button to try a few scenarios. We can increase this. Um, that's close to doubling it. Let's take a look again. You'll see that we are um, getting a greater effect as we would expect. Uh, magnitude is higher and the time is significantly shorter in this case uh, for the doubling of the heat. Back to again this particular graph which is our interest. Uh, this feature of long-term effects we see that we have shortened that time considerably um, to reach the one degree and Five degree changes it looks like roughly cutting that in half also so that's the first feature <coughs> excuse me that I'd like to refer us to um, a longer term effect graph that uh, can be worked with and we can also go the other direction on that and one of the interesting things that uh, the model will show again we'll talk about interpretations later but the effects of cooling would be a little bit less less and, and a little different than the heating effect because you have the existing uh, heating component uh, that's uh, you know concurrent that you're working against balancing so the effect of cooling is not uh, quite the same as the heating. Heating is generally a compounding situation. Uh, cooling has a, a point where a balance point is reached uh, with additional heat being required, you know, a loss of heat being required to reach that balance point. Okay and same thing on the on the graph flipping over to the cooling side. And here, here the interpretations would be that an, instead of a nice uh, crop loss is being given, which also could be done, but in this case, uh, relative to the onset of ice ages, the so-called Little Ice Age back in the 15, 1500s or so, with uh, estimated to have changed about one degree in centigrade, and also a full ice age estimated to occur when the global temperature drops roughly five degrees centigrade. So a degree is, is significant uh, in this uh, world of global climate modeling. Okay, that's the first effect. The second will be now the introduction of a random event into the model. As we have discussed in other videos, um, and I would encourage you to look at those, um, history is basically a record of change and sometimes very severe change and sometimes very quick change. In fact, it's, it's essentially guaranteed that such significant uh, and far-reaching changes will take place. Um, the section on the lower right here is, a, is an attempt to allow the user to understand that not everything falls according to a perfectly uh, smooth curve and that uh, random or chaotic events can occur uh, with climate. Examples of that would be uh, an asteroid um, uh, changing the entire uh, Earth's uh, climate, a volcano or a series of volcanoes, uh, massive release of a or change in a greenhouse gas uh, such as methane, uh, depending on how quick it came and how sudden. Uh, these might all fall into the case, and also by, by a combination of uh, those types of events. So this is a section of the model that allows for that. I'll put in um, one example just so that you see. Um, let's say you were to pick some kind of reference uh, point of a certain amount of change, and you'd look at that change, and you, what would help is just to record that in your that number in your head there, roughly about how much time is is involved to affect this particular change. Um, however, so we have 521 years there is what it amounts to. If you were to introduce a random change, you'll find that you have the ability to um, sort of regulate that. You'll also find that this is very much a, a, a nonlinear process, and I'll discuss that more in the later video. But when the Earth is near a stable state, uh, the random events will have more magnitude, will have greater effect than, than the when the things are already in a very strongly heating or cooling situation. So sometimes very 
uh, small changes are needed. In fact, I would always encourage you to experiment with, with experiment with the model with very small changes um, as you start to learn how it um, reacts. But in this case, let's say we introduced what would appear to be a relatively uh, high magnitude random event, and go ahead and hit this, and and we see that it dropped it down in half. And by the nature of being random. Um, you're not going to be able to predict what that effect will be. Sometimes it might be very extreme and sometimes it might be very small. It might flip you over um, to the other side where it becomes a cooling effect. Uh, basically anything can happen in terms of random events. So you can see that's changing from 500 to 400 years and you could start to shift that over to extremes and again randoms are function there. There's one that flipped you over to uh, the cooling side. So in a sense you'll lose control uh, of what you think you're trying to accomplish um, in a particular scenario and that's the point of introducing that to, to let us understand we don't always have control over a situation however much we might think that we do. That's the second um, addition that I'd like to make known in the model and the third and um, potentially the final one for at least for the time being. Uh, there's two other aspects I'd, I'd like to work into the model but it's really a, a much more uh, long-term affair and I'm not sure I'll be able to get to that. But we have a, a another factor that's now being incorporated into the model and that is an estimate of mortality, of, mortality effects. And that is when when these changes are made, whether it's going to be increases in heat or cooling or dramatic uh, changes in heat or cooling, and the introduction of aerosols. And by the way, the consideration here on mortality with aerosols is actually at the most minimal level. It's strictly from a mechanical point of view, as well as uh, heat influences. It has nothing to do with um, uh, health or biological aspects. That's, that's another whole layer of complication. But mechanically, mechanically alone from the existence of aerosols, there are known relationships uh, that uh, are known to affect mortality or increase the uh, death rate. So, um, this, um, let's drop this random back down to no effect there, and let's go ahead and get our relative influence there. there we're back to the 521 years in this particular example, and there was our long-term effects that we see. The last part that we're talking about right now is a new aspect of the model called mortality estimates. And the purpose here is just to let you know these, these um, options exist in the program and to encourage you to start looking at them uh, and their effects. Um, very briefly, the mortality estimates here are based upon um, uh, predictions, basically forecasts uh, from the World Health Organization. And those predictions alone can be subject to controversy uh, and dispute as most uh, every issue is, uh, at least from a political side, uh, social side on the global climate change issue. But nevertheless, uh, an estimate uh, has been worked out here. Also a nonlinear relationship has been developed. And um, I would encourage you to um, start experimenting with that. Uh, very briefly to show you the dramatic range and variability that would exist on this issue in terms of forecast models. The um, World Health Organization has a range of prediction, literally from a doubling of the population over the next 150 years to um, that of cutting the world population by 50 percent, cut uh, half the world's population uh, being gone within 150 years. So we'll discuss that more in a later time, but obviously rather wide range in, in allowance for severe um, changes uh, to be occurring. And that's also part of this model. So that's uh, all that I want to discuss now is just to simply let you know that these factors have been included and therefore the model as a whole now has um, several factors. First being that of uh, changes and everything in the model is allowing for both increases and decreases in general and there's no assumption that anything is in one particular direction but to allow us to investigate various combinations of these factors. One of them being the so-called greenhouse gases. 
uh, carbon dioxide and methane being the two primary um, um, gases affecting the heat exchange. So that's one factor. Another factor would be the introduction of aerosols, and we've had a discussion of that in one of the uh, separate videos. I'd encourage you to listen to that to get a little bit more depth on it, that issue, as that's a very, very complex uh, subject. And along with the aerosols, the, the number of times that that uh, introduction or operation is taking place. You also have a random event um, factor now included in the model. And then on the output side, there are now three, three outputs coming to you, the first being more of an instantaneous type of response to the system, uh, of which we have the three variables coming out of magnitude, uh, direction, and time on this first level. Second level being that of longer term effects being projected ahead and consequent uh, estimates on uh, crop loss. Uh, ability to produce food uh, and or onset of relative ice ages and the last being influences um, at least estimates uh, influences on mortality and incidentally these reference values that have been chosen here are for a 50 year time period projection and a 200 year time projection and of course there is a great deal of information down below here uh, that has also been discussed uh, to some detail at least um, in the other videos. Uh, by the way, while I'm here, one brief addition on this particular graph which was discussed in other videos. What we really notice in this graph is that this graph is also a function of latitude, um, um, not just magnitude basically of methane um, on a global side. So what the what, the, what this result is actually showing you on the methane side is that it's the lower latitudes uh, where, where the methane decrease is the greatest. Um, and the upper latitudes, the, the um, methane is still at a higher rate. So I wanted to add that footnote on to the previous discussions. So things are in a state of constant uh, change, sometimes can be uh, quite dramatic. And um, hopefully the more that you listen to the videos and use the model, um, you can see that uh, there's some uh, very important aspects of the climate change issues that are not necessarily adequately being discussed at this time. As well as mitigation uh, um, strategies, by the way. So thank you very much for your time today. This is Clifford Carnicum from the Carnicum Institute. I do plan to have another video that um, goes into a sort of comprehensive um, a application and interpretation of all of these factors uh, combined uh, so that we can see how they interact with each other. So have a great day and I look forward to talking to you again soon. Level. The first video has been completed on the tutorial side which introduces the greenhouse gas uh, component of this model which is on the left side, upper left side, upper left corner and it also introduced uh, the uh, aerosols into the model which is on the right side. In addition to that the output uh, from both of these inputs was also discussed. There are two additional videos available at this time that go into Hi, this is Clifford Carnicum from the Carnicum Institute, and this is the second in a tutorial series to in introduce uh, folks to the geoengineering and climate uh, change model. Uh, this tutorial will be very brief, as is the first tutorial, and is intended simply to demonstrate the mechanics of getting access to features on the program. and. It has nothing to do with interpretation of uh, events or analysis at a more specific to greater depth on analysis and interpretation of various scenarios using the model. I plan to make uh, another video of that nature that ties in all of the features that are now available in the model together. The purpose of this video is to introduce um, three other um, uh, developments that have been incorporated into this model, again from purely a mechanical point of view. 
Previously, the model only um, worked with immediate, or what I'd call here, it would change by uh, that much. It allows for the model allows for both increase, increases and decreases in all the variables um, that are occurring here. So let's say we introduced a little higher level of CO2 into the into the atmosphere. Then we will start to see some kind of effect, and we have discussed this prior. Um, uh, and um, you get it, the you basically get three things. You get the the direction of the change, being either heating or cooling effect. You get the magnitude of the change uh, by the all short-term effects. Um, let's start uh, using this a little bit so we can see. Let's say we bring up the model and we basically uh, don't know what to do. We don't do, any, do anything except just hit the submit button right here. And if you hit that, basically you'll have no response because you haven't made any changes. And that will be demonstrated up above. And you have a chance to uh, go back uh, with this uh, button here. And this time let's make a little bit of a change to the model. So we're increasing the carbon dioxide percent. This is an annual change in percent 